Um, okay, so uh, here we go. Uh, so we're going to talk about prevalence of sleep complaints and obstructive sleep apnea in particular. And I really focus on obstructive sleep apnea because that's the one that has a lot of implications for things that can be impacted uh, on an internal medicine basis, right? As opposed to when people talk about just sleep in general, obstructive sleep apnea is the one that has a lot more medical ramifications to it, right? So let's run through some of the stuff you've seen before about my disclaimers and all that, because every time I give a talk, I have to do this, uh, but I'll do it real quick because I think you're used to some of these by now. Uh, so that's my usual uh, disclaimer. Uh, I did not say what you thought I said. And at the bottom knows this one, he who laughs last thinks slowest. Um, and so that's uh, hopefully not me. Remember the books we've talked about? Again, just for conflict of interest, I have to do that by the state bar um, and uh, also by whenever I speak to medical organizations. Uh, so those are the books, you've seen them before. Um, and then uh, conflicts of interest, again, continue that. Uh, if at first you don't succeed, skydiving is not for you. Um, and uh, also uh, my boys, uh, this is three of my boys uh, hanging out and we're gonna talk about sleep. <clears throat> okay, so, uh, well, please wake up for this one. Everybody's sleeping. I need your attention. Uh, this ought to wake you up. This is from a colleague of mine who's walking down the street in his hometown. Look what he sees when the wind is blowing. That'll wake you up to know that's coming right at you. Uh, and I want to give thanks to some of the people I did some of the research with. And let's go over a little bit about obstructive sleep apnea, about the study. We'll do some general sleep comp concepts. And I'll just give you a lot of little bullet points of stuff from the medical literature. Hopefully it'll help for you. Okay. Obstructive sleep apnea, also called sleep disordered breathing, is very common, and there is a definition for this, right? Which means that you have to have at least five periods of time per hour while you're sleeping where the air's not getting through, right? All of us will have people say, oh, I heard you snore last night. Or someone says, oh, it looked like you're gasping last night. All those may be true symptoms, but it may not be obstructive sleep apnea. And so there's ways of looking at that because it makes a difference on whether or not somebody's going to have trouble, right? So there's these terms called the AHI, right? I'm going to try to define those for you. Or the amount of oxygenation that can be used to define what is obstructive sleep apnea, how much do you have to be impacted, right? So it's a shorthand here for you. Look, 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 look. You can have an apnea hypopnea index of five to 14. Moderate is 15, 29 severe, greater than 30 of these episodes in an hour, right? So look at this terminology. Look, look, look. You don't have to remember all this. I just want you to understand. This is some of the ways that we describe obstructive sleep apnea. So an apnea where you don't breathe for greater than equal 10 seconds. Okay, that's what it is. Hypopnea is where you have a little bit of breathing, right? Uh, not full cessation, but you also notice that the oxygen in the blood is dropping, right? Another indication, the air's not quite getting through, right? And then there's the AHI, which we already talked about. There's another one that's called REI, the ODI. I don't you to want to remember these specific details. I want you to remember that it has to do with how many of these episodes are you having? Is it true apnea where the air doesn't move for 10 seconds? Is it hypopnea where it moves, but weakly so? And how many per hour are you having of those things? That's how you define it. It's a numbers game, right? Now there's various methods been used to describe how to look at this, right? So first of all, let's say it's straight out. The gold standard for evaluating sleep is an overnight polysomnography test, okay? That's the gold standard. All the literature is based on it. All the certainty is based on it. That's what it is, okay? Now, I want to go through this with you very carefully. Multiple things, right? One, with my regular patients, right? Just forget about workers' conference. Just my regular patients. When I would send them to these overnight labs, I got a lot of complaints, right? It's cold, it's dark, I don't like being there with some strange person watching me sleep. I can't sleep if I'm not in my regular bed. So those are some of the problems with those polysomnography overnight tests. Number two, they can be very expensive, you know, thousands of dollars, right? But there's good data that you can do 
other things that are home-based testing, and there's literature, and I've given you uh, quotations here, uh, citations here, of literature that says, look, you can do home testing and get a very good, clear result, right, by doing it at home as opposed to sending it to a lab. And what happens if you do that? It's much cheaper. It's much quicker. The portable units don't cost nearly the same amount. That's why I do these uh, portable units, okay? At the current time, screening for sleep apnea is insufficient, right? Now, this depends on who you talk to. What does that mean? What does that mean? That means that you have all these patients and all these people write down things like, I can't sleep, I don't sleep well, right? And you say, well, okay, we got to investigate this. But there's actually some literature that says, look, it doesn't matter what they say. For a lot of these people, unless you see bad complications or bad reports, you know, there's no good data about screening them for sleep apnea, where those people say, oh, that's wrong. If people are having significant sleep complaints, you should screen them. What they do say, there's no difference in outcome by who does this work. Is it a sleep specialist, a primary care provider? It doesn't matter, right? As long as they have the equipment, that's what matters, right? But sleep apnea is very important. Why? Because look, look, look. Look at all these things that are associated with sleep apnea. Look at that. Accidents, obesity, hypertension, strokes, clots, right? Look at all that stuff, right? Which means that if somebody has sleep apnea, it can contribute to these things. And it also means that if somebody has hypertension or has some of these other metabolic changes, they could be at risk for sleep apnea and they could clue you in, right? And we do know that if you don't sleep well, by the way, this is true, sleep apnea, no sleep apnea. If you don't sleep well, if you don't try to get yourself seven to eight hours, it actually makes it that you're going to have weight gain. Now, I want you to think about this. Think, think, think. Look, look at this. Look, look, look. You would think, they'd say, well, Mark, I'm a real go-getter. And I get up all the time. And so I only sleep five hours a night. You would think, well, oh, that person must be burning a lot of energy. It's not true. What happens is, is our bodies adjust to that. And then we don't do a good job of maintaining our weight. So getting adequate sleep, sleep apnea, no sleep apnea is very important for you. Okay. Treatment. If you treat it, does it make a difference? Answer? Yes. Overwhelming literature. If you have sleep apnea, you should treat it. Right. So what are some of the risks for this? Right. So look, I showed you that on the list. There's another reference on this list. Look at these things. Right. We talked about the obesity, obviously. Family history. Rectinopathy, that's where if you ever notice somebody that has a small jaw and the jaw tends to go backwards, so they can even have a little bit of an overbite. What that's doing is it's making the airway at the back of your throat smaller and they can get sleep apnea that way, right? What are some of the symptoms, okay? So now you're all going to look at this and say, I must have sleep apnea, right? Because look at all these things. Yeah, I do that, I do that, I do that, right? But it starts to give you an idea of what you can expect if you're taking a history or a patient is saying, look, I have this problem or that problem. Look at this list, right? When they have the irritability, the mood, right? The morning headaches, uh, those can be sleep apnea symptoms, right? All right. How do you screen for it? Okay, so a lot of people here know about the Epworth Stupidus Scale, right? But there's other screen tests. One's called Stop Bang, right? And what you start doing is, looking at patients to see, do they seem to have any of these criteria, right? In particular, when you see that body mass index going up, that's a big indicator that that's going to be a problem. When you see the people with the big, heavy, thick necks, that's a big indicator, right? That you know that it's going to be operating here, right? And when you look at somebody, when you examine them, there's also this pattern, right? So if you want to take a look at yourself, Go take a look and look in the mirror and look at the opening of your mouth in the mirror. So if you have a big open airway, then the air gets through easily. But some people have that uvula hanging down, that soft palate hanging down, and it's really crowding out the tongue. You're going to be more likely. So that's why when we talk about obstructive sleep apnea, we say it's really 
by two things, the anatomy of the neck and your weight. That's the vast majority of obstructive sleep apnea. The anatomy, what you're born with, what the size of your throat is, and how much weight do you have, right? Okay, rest up. So what we're going to do is I'm going to show you one of the studies uh, that we did uh, in the office on sleep apnea and sleep complaints, right? In the California Workers' Compensation Population, this was uh, published also, okay? Um, so this is uh, all the patients that were referred here uh, during a 10-month period uh, that had sleep complaints, right? Did the standard review systems, did the standard activity daily living, did the upper sleep scale, right? And then for the testing, right? Used a portable device. We've talked about that. We've talked about the data that says that portable devices work well. They're quick, they're cheap, people do them at home, and it gives you a quick look. Do they have sleep apnea? Do they not have sleep apnea, right? So we have 330 patients that came in during that period of time, right? 210 said they had sleep problems, right? 210 or 330 patients. This is a huge number. Of course, this is California. Everybody has to feel the experience, but that's a huge number, right? Out of those, got 206 successful studies, okay? So that's the data, right? As opposed to when you say to patients go to sleep lab, you know, so many of these, I can't go, I can't figure it out, and it gets delayed, delayed. These are much quicker and easier to get back from the patients, right? Right. Let's take a look at this population, right? So we're in California population, 210 out of 330 said they had sleep complaints, 206 had good studies to look at, right? So what do you see? First of all, what's the prevalence of obstructive sleep apnea in this population that had sleep complaints? Almost 57%. That's huge, way above national averages, right? And patients with obstructive sleep apnea, no surprise, had higher body mass index, had greater amounts of hypertension, diabetes, dyslipidemia. Now, what these are on the side here is, uh, I've given this talk before to doctor groups, right? So these are called p-values. And what does it mean? It's statistically significant, meaning that people with sleep apnea versus no sleep apnea, those with sleep apnea were much more likely statistically. This is not just random chance, right? That they're gonna have this problem, all right? Next, let's look. Okay, look at, look, 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 look at this table, look, look, look. So you've got obstructive sleep apnea here, not obstructive sleep apnea here, okay? So how many were men? So you see there's a lot more men in the sleep apnea group. How old were they? Not a big difference. But look at that, the body mass index, how fat they were, those stars, statistically significant differences right down the list, right? And that's what you see in the literature. That's also what we see in California in this study, right? Next, look, look up. Note that the patient complaints did not help you in knowing whether or not they have sleep apnea or not sleep apnea. So look, look, look. Here's sleep apnea's list. Here's non-sleep apnea. So patients will say to you, I can't think clearly, I got headaches, I got depression, I got anxiety. Those things don't help you, right? So in other words, you have to test to know, is there something going on in particular? Is the sleep apnea there, right? Okay, next, four more results. Uh, note that all these conditions correlated with obstructive sleep apnea. So in other words, what I've been saying to you is, look, if you start having reports, we see people with diabetes, hypertension, right? Those things are clues that sleep apnea may be operating on that patient, right? So those are how they interact, right? The sleep apnea seems to lead those things. Those things seem to be bellwethers, markers to let you know there might be some sleep troubles underneath that. And you need to know that because you need to know how to treat these people adequately and know what's causing their conditions. All right, rest up. These are the boys when they were much younger in front of Old Faithful. And can you imagine trying to get my guys to stay still for an Old Faithful picture? That was uh, that was it. Okay, next, sleep apnea. Well, what do you think caused it? OPC number one. And lo and behold, which group of uh, occupation has the greatest rates of obesity in the United States? There you go, public safety, right? So you're going to see this a lot in those types of individuals, right? 
And so that's one of the things that you think about when you're thinking about that body mass index and that sleep apnea, okay? And I think we've talked about some of this before, but just general reminder, right? That obesity according to age group, right? And then you see in children, and what's going on here is as the years have been going by, look at the rates of obesity going up in the world, right? Look here, look, 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 right? This is boys and girls. This is men and women. And what you see is, is what's the rates of obesity, right? You can see it's going up and up and that's going to translate to more hypertension, more diabetes, more sleep apnea, right? And you're gonna see more disability, right? 1990, 2015, look at the rates of disability are going up because of the sleep apnea, right? Now, in law enforcement, I've told you that they tend to be higher weights, right? And there are studies that show that it's more common and sleep apnea is very prevalent. And by the way, the U.S. Court of Appeals said that there's no automatic impairment for obesity uh, and that the ADA is an anti-discrimination, not a public health issue. So if somebody's having troubles with sleep apnea, it's not like you're running up against an ADA issue and you, you have to accommodate this. No, no way. You have to have a safe work environment, right? Okay, so let's talk a little bit about some of the additional literature on this and what it's saying and what we think about, okay? I keep trying to lose weight, but it keeps finding me. Um, or here's another one way to lose weight. Uh, the complaint department knows, Ark, you only brought two ants. That's going to drop your weight. Um, let's take another look at uh, some of these risks, right? So sure enough, Here's the difference between then and now, 1990, big television, little guy. Here, little television, big guy, right? That's the changes, okay? So we go to the fifth edition of the AMA guides. There's a section on obstructive sleep apnea. It's in the uh, pulmonary uh, chapter, right? And that's probably the most common area in medicine that we talk about it. And I know that sometimes people will also go and look at other parts of the AMA guides, including neurology chapter, which is fine, but this is really the home of obstructive sleep apnea, right? And if you have obstructive sleep apnea, then you need to know it's operating, right? And don't forget, if there's no sleep apnea, this could be other things, right? Now, I want to highlight a couple things here. Very important. Listen, listen, listen. Very important. If they have sleep apnea, okay, that's clear. If they have sleep complaints, but you don't find sleep apnea, well, then this could be, and the patients will usually say this, oh, it's just because I hurt. My back hurts when I'm sleeping, right? or this could be I'm stressed out, right? So those are activities of daily living that are impacted by an orthopedic or psychiatric problem. I'm gonna say that again, it's very important. If somebody has sleep complaints, what you really wanna do is, okay, do they have sleep apnea, right? Cause that makes a big difference on what we're doing. And if not, they may not have an internal medicine diagnosis but they may have some sleep complaints that are due to orthopedic difficulties or psychiatric difficulties, which are in activities of daily living impacting those people and therefore should be impacting those ratings, right? Some facilities, by the way, like UC San Diego, a lot of places now just do pulse oximetry. They don't even give people sleep monitors. They just said, we're just going to take one of those little things. We're just going to check your oxygen and say, you know, if the oxygen doesn't drop much, then there's probably not much going on there, right? And so that's a quick, cheap way to look for alternative testing for sleep apnea, right? And there's other ways that you can do it with other testing, what is called a psychomotor vigilant test. There's all kinds of stuff. Um, but mind you, what's important to keep in mind is that there's still the portable units, the simple units. You don't need that overnight sleep study, okay? Um, okay, rest stop, all right? So let's talk about some of these other diagnoses, right? If you can't hibernate, I'm gonna refer to a sleep disorder clinic. All right, so here we go. So one you may have heard about is restless leg syndrome, which could be associated with cardiovascular disease. Uh, when you hear restless legs, consider the SSRIs, right? Which is like Prozac and all those types of medicines. Anxiety will do it, iron deficiency. And you can often treat this with gabapentin, right? So restless leg syndrome could be something that's operating. And if you have a restless leg syndrome, that's gonna be the kind of thing that uh, might uh, require a different kind of treatment, right? Uh, Here's a difficulty if this guy had restless leg syndrome. I'm afraid it's restless leg syndrome. That'd be bad, okay? Other diagnosis, like sleeping at work, okay? So 
here we go. Let's take a look at some of the sleep apnea literature. These are just little bullet points of different studies that I just want to show you about some of the stuff out there. I don't expect you to remind all this. You got the handouts and stuff, but just little bullet points to let you think about what is sleep apnea and how does it impact you? Okay. All right. So here we go. Right. So we talked about the obesity estimate, right? Exercise reduces sleep apnea, even if you don't lose weight. Why? Because if you start doing good regular exercise, it starts tightening the muscles, toning the muscles in your body. And that includes the muscles of your neck. So those airways are going to open up more, right? Um, one study found 21% of commercial drivers had sleep apnea, right? It happens a lot. Uh, asthma. If somebody has reactive airways asthma, that could increase the risk, right? And don't forget when patients say, well, you know, sleep apnea, I, I can't tolerate that machine, right? Well, there's other tricks besides CPAP machine. There's these jaw devices. There's positional things you can do. So there are other treatments for sleep apnea if you have somebody and they say they're having trouble with it, right? Other information in the literature on sleep apnea. Transportation drivers in Japan have sleep apnea. Uh, the CPAP definitely helps symptoms. There's been some back and forth in the literature. Does it really benefit the cardiovascular system? In other words, if you have hypertension, diabetes, and you treat their sleep apnea, does it make it better? So some of the literature says yes, some says maybe not, right? But we do know that if you have somebody on CPAP and you stop it, their blood pressure goes right back up, right? So we do think overall, and I certainly do think that treating it makes a difference, right? We know that if you use CPAP, if you treat the sleep apnea, your quality of life goes up, right? And this is more than what's called the MAD, which is mandibular advancement device. So you may have seen those. These are these little things that people put in their teeth and their mouth to try to make that jaw go forward. So it opens up that airway. And is it worth treating? Yes, right? Because if you treat it, then you don't have a loss of work productivity, right? If you treat it, your better outcomes in surgery and other approaches, right? CPAP versus mandibular advancement device. We talked a little bit about that. Sleep impacts on the workplace health has economic impacts, meaning people are more productive if they get better sleep, which is why I'm telling you. If you say, well, I'm a go-getter, I do five, six hours, you're wrong. It's not enough. You've got to try to get more sleep, right? Uh, you uh, uh, have more sleep apnea, usually with greater amounts of obesity, you're going to have more musculoskeletal injuries, okay? Um, and uh, commercial drivers, we've talked about that group, right? Now, another type of sleep trouble, okay? Now we're not just talking about sleep apnea. Now we're talking about shift work, right? So sleep problems are very common in shift work. Uh, this can get better over time. So I want to be very clear about this, very clear. Listen, listen, listen. If somebody says, look, I like to work 10 p.m. to 6 a.m. Monday through Friday, it's perfect for me. It works for my family. It works for my kids. It works for my errands. I never change my schedule. That's what I always do. That's how I sleep. Then that's probably not so much of a shift work impact because it's regular. Shift work is more if you're changing it, right? Which, by the way, by the way, wait, 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 wait. look, 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 look. Shift work impacts, especially with quick returns. Okay, so uh, look, 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 look. It's very important. Listen, listen, listen. Let's say that you say to me, oh, Mark, I had a really bad, busy day, and I stayed up till 10 o'clock or 11 o'clock at night to get this work done. And I had to be in court the next day at 7 a.m. or 8 a.m. or something like that. And you say, well, okay, you know, so I pulled it together, right? You may have pulled it together, but you definitely impacted yourself. Because shift work has these impacts if you do what's called a quick return, which means 11 hours. Means you're supposed to have at least 11 hours between when you stopped working and when you started working, right? You're supposed to have at least 11 hours, right? All right, shift work also changes the hormonal environment and you can start getting even thyroid nodules just out of shift work, just by working irregular hours, right? Uh, because it has an effect on our metabolism. It changes who we are and how we process, right? Okay, more studies. Uh, if you lack social support at home, it's associated with sleep problems. Excessive sleepiness is poor work production. Nighttime awakens affect your cost, right? Affect your performance, right? Uh, gives you more fatigue. Uh, 
leads to uh, transportation operator injuries, right? This stuff is important. If you add a pedometer at work, it improves your sleepiness. You know, there's something about, you know, these people say, oh, I do 10,000 steps a day, or I have this Apple watch, I'm watching myself. If you do that, that alone, but us just checking, it seems to help, right? We talked about no difference in outcomes between treated by sleep specialists or a primary physician. Um, lower melatonin secretion, melatonin screen when you get good sleep, uh, may lead to diabetes if you're not getting good sleep. Um, by the way, a lot of us are impacted the society we live in or, you know, the typical, the company you keep. So a lot of people say, well, I'm a night person, right? Well, most people tend to be night people because of the, uh, their family, uh, the types of things that they like to do that they think their normal rhythm, but we were really meant to go to sleep when the sun goes down. That's what we're meant to do. And we're meant to get uh, a good sleep that way. If you can, it would, uh, help. Now let's say that you're not able to get all the sleep you want right? What can you do, right? So first of all, napping will lower your risk, right? There's nothing wrong with a little siesta, right? So uh, if you take, you know, five, 10 minutes, middle of the day, take a little nap, it will help, okay? Um, and if you have proper attention to the work factors, meaning if you're really trying to regiment yourself well and not have those late nights, keep, a, keep your schedule going regularly, you'll do better. If you have uh, a work environment, with a lot of noise or poor air quality, right? That could cause you to not have good sleep at night. So you gotta know are you in a, a decent, healthy environment, okay? All right, here we go. So here we go, the DMV driver's license office. Got that? Okay, uh, that, I don't think they're gonna pass their uh, license that day. Okay, uh, you only only in a DMV office. Okay, so here we go, right? I'm gonna show you a quiz, right? Here we go, here's the quiz. RK, 52 year old man. Presents your office with preventive health visit. He is overweight, has hypertension, hyperlipidemia, and is stable on his medication. One of his coworkers was dying with sleep apnea, and he says to you, hey, look, should I be screened, right? So do you remember we talked about this, right? Based on the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force, do they recommend screening in general, right? He should be screened. He should be screened. He should be told there's uncertainty about screening. He should not be screened, right? So remember we talked about this, right? Some agency says definitely, others say probably not. So probably right now the answer would be C. Though most would probably use a portable unit anyways, he should be told there's uncertainty about screening them. But in general, as soon as someone brings this up, as soon as I get a little indication, as soon as I get some of those history of some of those conditions, I'm going to want to screen them, right? Okay, number two, ready? Question number two, ready? Which of the following statements about risk for sleep apnea are correct? Alcohol and sedatives use, increased risk. Women for postmenopausal use, increased risk. Higher body mass index. And those craniofacial abnormalities, including that jaw stuff, are associated with decreased risk, right? All right, so look at that, All right? So look, the answers here, we talked about some of this stuff, right? The answers are B and C. Uh, remember we talked about how the population is aging, especially the gals as they get older, uh, they have more risk of getting obesity. And then the body medicine is talked about this. Remember, we talked about the craniofacial. It increases your risk for sleep apnea. You got that small jaw. It's going backwards in your throat. That's going to give you that particular trouble. Okay. All right. Question number three. Which of the following statements about epidemiology of a sleep apnea in the United States is correct? Right. The rate of progression for mild, mild, and severe has been well characterized and established in clinical practice. The current prevalence is 10%. Sleep apnea is more common in women than men. The prevalence increases with age, right? So we talked about this, right? When we said, look, we see different studies looking at different amounts. So we don't really know that progression, right? Prevalence, we talked about this. I showed you the California study. The numbers are much higher, right? Could be 20%, could be 30, 40%, depending on the population you're with, right? Sleep apnea, more common women then? No, remember I showed you that the men were dominating then? So the prevalence increases with age, right? So that, that's, that's really it. Okay, so look, this is uh, a summary of the, the sleep stuff and things to consider, right? We talked about the importance of keeping in mind that when somebody has sleep complaints, right? First thing you wanna know, is it sleep apnea, right? That's the big one, right? Because I showed you all these things that's associated with, right? I showed you the uh, problems with hypertension, diabetes. If you treat it, it may help, right? 
And certainly, we know that sleep apnea can sometimes lead to arrhythmias, right? It certainly impacts work performance, right? So you want to know sleep apnea, no sleep apnea. If there's not sleep apnea, it could be a reaction to the orthopedic stuff. It could be a reaction to the psychiatric stuff. It could be restless leg syndrome. Sometimes you can't find anything, right? But those are the kind of things that you're going to think about, right? And what we see in the literature is that there's reasons to know about this, reasons to test for it. There's subtle ways of doing that. And then when you do that, uh, you can uh, actually get some uh, some good information and help these folks out. Okay, th that's honestly.